Well, this is going to be a kind of a rerun of an event which took place in 2007 uh, with the so-called Four Horsemen, where in uh, Christopher Hitchens' Washington apartment, uh, four of us uh, sat down together and discussed, and it was filmed on DVD. Um, at that time, Ayan Hersi Ali was supposed to be the fifth. And right up to the last minute, she was going to be of that company. Uh, at the last minute, a sudden emergency took her to Holland, and very reluctantly, she had to cancel. And so we ended up as four horsemen rather than, well, four plus one horsewoman. Um, <laughs> the five pillars. So it's extremely uh, agreeable and appropriate that she should join us today. So welcome, Ayan. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. As we did last time, we are going to have no chairman. We're just going to see how the conversation uh, takes us. And um, so, who would like to start? Dan, would you like to? Um, we had a question for uh, for Ayan, I think you wanted to. Okay, let me let me try that question. This is something that's bothered me, and I, any advice you can give me, I'd be very very pleased. I know that some liberal Muslims that I've approached, where I've said, "How can I help? How can how can I?" show my support for you, they say, well, thank you, but don't. Because if I am viewed by my enemies in the church as an ally of a godless Western atheist, that's the kiss of death for me. That ties my hands. You spoke very eloquently about the failure of liberals to uh, rise to the needs. Tell me how to do it. I would love to play a, a bigger role, but I'm not sure how to do it. Wow, that's some question. <laughs> um, I think first, um, I, I don't know the individual Muslims who you spoke with, and I don't want to say that I doubt their sincerity. Um, but if they are truly liberal, if they're truly seeking to bring about justice, then um, they would ask the hard questions. And if they did that, for instance, is every word in the Quran the true word of God and infallible and so on? Is the Prophet Muhammad infallible? If they asked these questions in the mosque and to other Muslims, they wouldn't need your kiss of death. They would have it. They would have it of, already. Yes. They would have it already. Yeah. Yeah. And so that brings me to, and I, again, I don't want to imply that these individuals are insincere, but that for Islam to really change, for Muslims to change their attitudes toward that kind of complete submission of mind, these questions have to be asked. And if they're not asked um, inside or from the inside, then it's our duty to ask those questions if we assume um, that Muslims, regardless of their shortcomings, are fellow humans. And, and do you think that, for instance, the internet provides uh, a medium that makes it easier for, uh, for Muslims to get this questioning underway in a good way, do you think so? Um, I think the internet is a medium like any other, and it yeah. is used, for instance, by Islamists yeah. to promote a message of fear and the horrors <coughs> of the hereafter and that sort of thing. Yeah. But it's also a medium that can be used. I read the tweets by Hamza Kashgari um, uh, yeah. y yesterday. So, yes, enlightened Muslims, Muslims who really do want to make a change, can use the internet. They do use the internet. They use pseudonyms. Um, to avoid threats and yeah. to avoid, you know, uh, their lives and, and not just theirs but their own families mm -hmm. from being threatened. So in that sense, the internet can be useful, is useful, uh, but it's only one way of of doing it. I think there's a suggestion of a failure of Western liberals when it comes to almost the opposite of what of what Dan was suggesting. Um, at the time of the the fatwa against uh, Salman Rushdie, some of the most <laughs> disgraceful episodes yeah. were Western liberals who almost sided with the 
up with the Ayatollah, as though somehow they were expiating their collective guilt for yeah. what white people have been doing um, throughout, throughout history. There's a kind of, Nick, Nick Cohen has just written a rather good book called You Cannot Read This Book, which is about, uh, which is about censorship. And one of his attacks is on Western liberals who are all fine and liberal when it comes to all sorts of good causes in our, in, in our Western society. But when it comes to anything to do with another race, and especially when it comes to Islam, they suddenly pull back yeah. and say, oh, well, of course, it's part of their culture. We have yes. to let them do whatever they like. And so if they want to beat their wives or what, whatever it is, then it's part of their culture. It must be allowed, uh, allowed to happen. In Britain, there is, uh, I'm told on good authority, plenty of female genital mutilation going on in England. It's obviously it's against the law, but the police turn a blind eye for fear of being thought racist and Islamophobic. So do you think there's a, a problem here that we've got to stop being so afraid of being thought racist and Islamophobic and got to come out and apply our liberal yeah. principles elsewhere in the world, not just in our own country? Um. Yeah. 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 Yes, Richard, I think, and this is what I've been saying for the last 10 years or more, um, if you think through the logic of racism, um, if little girls of seven, eight years old cannot be protected by British law, um, then you start to wonder what exactly is racist. If little, the genitals of little white girls were being cut off, there would be enormous outrage. But they just... Mm. So this, this shyness and this self-imposed embarrassment about, oh my goodness, if we protect human life from true suffering, then we will be thought of as racist. Then once you think through that logic, then you come to the conclusion that by doing nothing, you're being worse than racist. In many ways, you're actually being complicit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that the, the humanities and social sciences uh, have a lot to answer for in their infatuation, which now seems to be waning with uh, postmodernism and a sort of hyper-multiculturalism, which I think is one of the most reactionary forces on the planet. Yeah, yeah. And there's, there's a, I mean, that, that's what I was that problem, as I saw it, was what I was responding to in, in the moral landscape. Uh, but I think there's a, we, we, the atheist community is somewhat culpable for this we, cause, because we're criticizing faith and ir irrational belief in gods. What I've run into in talking about Islam specifically among atheists is a sense that we have to be, we ha we're somehow logically committed to being equally opposed to all religions irrespective of their effects. So to sort of single out Islam from the point of view of atheism is somehow uh, to be co-opted by, these, these, uh, by bigotry, by an, al an alliance with, with Christians. Uh, uh, but, I mean, there's, there's, nothing that, there's nothing that demands that we not notice the different consequences between different faiths. I mean, any, anyone who is... Uh, just as worried about the Amish or about Anglicans as they are about mm -hmm. Islam, is just reading the wrong section of the newspaper. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, clearly Islam is, it imposes a unique uh, burden on us and on, on just rational people everywhere to criticize unjustified belief. And, but and actually, I, we're, yeah. we're, we're accused of the reverse very often. I mean, the, the so-called fatwa envy, where, where we're accused <laughs> of going after Christianity. And, and Christians with some, some relish sort of say, well, you don't go after Islam, do you? Yeah. Um, and I think we need to discuss that because it's true that um, the, the threat of having your head cut off um, is somewhat of a deterrent. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, courage is a virtue, but there are limits. 
And yeah. um, I, I've prepared what I think is a reasonable response, which, which I would give if I were, say, I don't know, an editor of a newspaper accused of not printing uh, a, a cartoon of, of Mohammed. Um, I think I would say something like this. I may give in to your demand for censorship because I fear your barbarism. <laughs> but don't for one moment confuse that with respect. I don't respect you, I despise you. <laughs> But maybe others have, have other responses. I mean, yeah, I... Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, Ayan and I were just speaking about this uh, before we came out on stage. I think you do have to pick your moments. I remember after the, the, the cartoon controversy, sometime afterwards, uh, there was a, um, a kind of a resurgence of, of talk about it. Uh, and I thought, well, why don't I just start a, a cartoon contest? I mean, I could kick this off in a big way. I'll just... You just you, online, you know, the best cartoon of Muhammad. And then it took me about 30 seconds to realize, all right, this is the thing that's going to get me killed. And this is, this, <laughs> this is, this is, it's not fundamentally different from anything I've done in my criticism of Islam. I mean, I, I've written, I, I, think oh. they, I think it's impossible to be more vituperative of Islam than I've been. Um, but this is the sort of thing that is salient enough for totally crazy reasons that you know, you have to go into hiding for, and, that, and that's what someone else two weeks later did it and then had to go into the witness protection program. So I think you, you do have to pick your moments, and, and uh, I mean, and Ion, more than, than uh, any of us, really lives with, with the, kind of the burden of, of uh, just how peevish uh, and insane uh, her critics are, and, and so. Yeah. Well, thank you. Nick Cohen has a rather chilling story at the time of the uh, Salman Rushdie. No, it might have been the cartoons, I forget which. I think it was the Salman Rushdie affair. Um, the Penguin, the publisher of um, the Satanic Verses, the uh, chairman of Penguin, I forget his name, was threatened, and uh, his daughter was threatened, and other parents at his daughter's school tried to get her expelled from the school because they were afraid that the school, that she, they, they were afraid that she might be attacked at the school. And they said, and they might get the wrong girl. <laughs> <laughs> and the chairman of Penguin said, you mean my daughter is the right girl? <laughs> well, this, I mean, it, it's good that you bring it up. And... Um, I went through it in the Netherlands when uh, for years I was moved from safe house to safe house and finally the government found me an apartment and had the apartment not only bulletproof but bazooka proof. <laughs> and the apartment was surrounded by a secret service policeman in and out of uniform. But then my neighbors went to court basing themselves on a human rights article, yeah. European human rights article, and actually got me evicted. And the argument was exactly the same. Um, it's, we don't mind you, you know, who you are, and we think you're doing a great job, but the fact that you live next to us, um, this was an apartment building, I lived above or beneath someone, uh, that that put them in danger. And it's the appeals court that ruled that I had to leave, mm. uh, observing their human rights. And I think that it's by giving this sort of not just acknowledgement, um, but it's surrender. By surrendering in this way to the threats preemptively, uh, that encourages the people who use uh, the argument that might is right. And, and did anybody raise the issue? <clears throat> did anybody raise the issue with your neighbors of how about you folks having a little courage too? sharing the risk. How about everybody sharing the risk? If we all share the risk, then it's yeah. a lot better for everybody. Although, well, in defense of her neighbors, I think it's a little much to ask of a randomly selected sample of, of neighbors yeah. who just yeah. happened to <laughs> accidentally live next to her. I mean, I, I understand the neighbors' fear. Yeah, sure. Um, but in terms of, I mean, there, there need to be 10,000 people like Ayan stepping forward all at once to share the risk. And 
And then the, mo the most deplorable thing about the Salman Rushdie affair mm -hmm. was that he was out there, just left out there by himself yeah. forever. And, and uh, uh, so yeah, 10,000 targets is, is a very different scenario. And so, we, so public intellectuals have to share the risk. Yeah. Uh, there's no question. Yeah. 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 Right, so perhaps we should move on to another, to another topic. Yeah. Um, w at the Reason Rally, uh, I um, said something which came in for a certain amount of criticism, and I, I'm trying to decide whether I ought to apologize or not. Um, I said something like um, that when you meet somebody like a Roman Catholic who holds ridiculous beliefs, for example, about the transubstantiation, um, that you should withhold respect from that belief. And I think it came across as withholding respect from the individual, individual Catholic, which I must say is very tempting. Um, <laughs> but I, I, what I was trying to say was that, w that you should challenge the Catholic or whoever it is holds the absurd belief in this case, that a wafer, when blessed by a priest, uh, literally, literally, turns into a first century Jew. Um, I didn't quite hear that. Don't or do? Don't, no, okay. Um, anyway, um, it came across as, as um, being something that um, I, I should apologize for because it suggested disrespect for the individual. Um, I actually quoted Johan Hari, the British journalist, who says, I respect you too much to respect your ridiculous beliefs. Hmm. And that's not a bad way of putting that's it. That's good. Um, <laughs> but I actually, I actually thought of modifying that to, I respect you too much to believe that you could possibly hold such ridiculous beliefs. No. Um, and if you, if you seriously call yourself a Roman Catholic, will you please either defend that belief in transubstantiation and explain why it's not ridiculous, or else admit that you're not really a Roman Catholic at all. Yes. You can't have it both ways. And that, that's, I think, what I, sh what I should have said. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, there's just no way that you can politely suggest to somebody that they have devoted their life to a folly. <laughs> but sometimes you have to say that. Yeah. And you can say, pardon me, sir or madam, not meaning any disrespect, but has it occurred to you that you're... You've wasted your life. That you've wasted your life. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, that, that is, Dan, that is actually, in my experience, the, mm -hmm. the, the highest hurdle for people to clear. I, I, I once yeah. had the benefit of, of just by accident winding up at a dinner table with someone who had been a lifelong, super devout Catholic and had lost her faith like that morning. <laughs> and so she was just, you know, uh, you know eyes ado with, with the, kind of the new moment in her life. And, and the thing she couldn't get over was how much time she had wasted. Yeah. I mean, all of the, just the invest, the sunk cost of emotional yeah. attention and I mean, all of the, the rituals and all of the things she didn't study when she was busy trying yeah. to be the most informed Catholic in human history. Uh, it just was, I mean, that was so agonizing and that was, it takes, it, it takes people so long to just blast through that and, yeah. and start yeah. a new moment in life. It's a, it's a bit, ironic to realize that church leaders understand this too. One of the more interesting themes in the discussion of the uh, Dennett Lascola first study from some of the religious leaders was they were giving advice to, to preachers how to deal with, with uh, candor with your congregation. Mm. And basically one of them said, I can't remember which, just as well that I can't, said, if you have an old congregation, <laughs> um, don't try to, at this point, don't try to change their minds. Just mouth the familiar words and let them go to their graves, basically, without anybody challenging their faith. However, if you have a mixed-age 
congregation, then you've got your job cut out for you because then, of course, what you have to do is speak with tongues, in <laughs> tongues, rather. You have to, uh, with a forked tongue, rather. What you have to do is <laughs> say nothing that will offend or shake the faith of the old folks while somehow letting on to the youngsters that you don't really mean it. <laughs> Hard I, job. I had an Australian friend who, when asked why it was that there are so many old people in church, he said, and you'll have to pardon my attempt at an Australian accent, cramming for the final? <laughs> 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 this morning at um, I think it was during Jeannie Scott's talk she said something like um, I'll, take an, I'll take allies wherever I find them and that, that's a very um, uh, understandable point of view and, and when you are campaigning for uh, science education when you're, trying, you're fighting a battle for proper science education for getting rid of creationism in schools uh, and, and, in, and now, in, in, her, in her case, um, uh, climate change denial. Um, to, to seek allies wherever you can find them, to make a compact with, uh, shall we say, the relatively sensible religious people um, who, uh, who are relatively happy with, with evolution does seem like political sense. Um, it's not a thing that I've ever been very enthusiastic about. I mean, to, to me, the, the battle for evolution is just a skirmish in a larger war, uh, a, a larger war for rationality, uh, for skepticism, for critical thinking, for a rational scientific view of the whole world, the whole universe, the whole of, the whole of life. And so to, to seek um, allies for this particular skirmish of, of evolution is, would not be my inclination. But I can see the political value of doing that. I wonder what... Uh, my colleagues think about uh, that. I think that it's important to make a distinction between leaders and followers. Um, we all have our informants that we trust on various matters, whether it's physics or chemistry or politics, and that's okay. We, we outsource some of our judgments. We can't study everything properly. And it's no wonder that, for instance, in the United States, many people view their pastor as a reliable source of information. The pastor says it, then this is to a first approximation. They think they ought to, they ought to go along with it. Now, I think that's a respectable attitude uh, uh, as long as they vet their pastor. <laughs> as long as they make sure that their pastor uh, isn't a bit of a fraud. And I think that if we go after the pastors, and especially when we go after the pastors, go after the, the leaders in the church that are telling their pastors to say this. I think we should be really tough on the religious leaders who encourage their pastors to tell these preposterous stories about creationism to their congregations. We should, we should give the congregations, if not quite a free pass, we should, we should treat them uh, as more as victims than as, uh, as villains in this. Yeah. All right. Well, I, Richard, I understood you to be asking whether it's uh, just too odious to align your, your, mm. your narrow interest of defending, let's say, the teaching of evolution in schools um, with a you know, more moderate Christ, you know, believing Christians, um, or if we just have to uh, uh, not form any dishonest alliance uh, and and I mean, so this is something that Ion has to deal with a lot mm -hmm. in a much more um, arguably more important matter that, that that the people who really get the problem her problem and the problem of Islam are not just Christians but the the more uh, uh, the, the more fundamentalist they get the more they understand her problem and the yeah. more they, they sympathize yeah. with it and yeah. so I don't know if you have anything to say about the, the inconvenient yeah. alliance between you and, and Christianity. Yeah. Well, what I say in uh, my book, Nomad, and I, I sent it, uh, I sent you the manuscript before I published, I think I, yeah. I sent to Richard and to Sam. Um, the point I was trying to make was that it's unrealistic um, for individuals who have lived with Islam and 
been completely indoctrinated to jump from being uh, true Muslims, practicing Muslims, to atheists like me. Uh -huh. and, and I also, I didn't jump. It took me at least, at least 10 years, the 10 years that I was in the Netherlands surrounded uh, by a culture of critical thinking and the shock of 9-11 to get out of that mindset. And after the publication of Infidel, I was getting uh, emails from ex-Muslims. But these ex-Muslims, now very much familiar with the weaknesses of Islam and very clear on why they left Islam, didn't want to make that leap. They wanted to be religious. And um, the one red line, I mean, the, the, the main recurring theme in these letters was, I think, um, pertains to what you talked about this morning about death and consolation. They wanted to give up the horrors of the hereafter, but they didn't want to give up the consolation of religion. So they became Christians. And in that sense, uh, they converted from a malign God to a benign God, uh, an unfriendly, hostile God that was going to burn and broil them to a God, at least in the modern sense of Christianity, said that there is no hell anymore, so there's just heaven. Uh, and I thought it instrumental, useful, uh, to encourage Muslims to give up that bad God and convert to this, um, well, friendly God who is, you know, the God of the Bishop of Canterbury, <laughs> the Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> I must say, I have sometimes wondered whether when, when attacking the mild strain of the virus, which is, which is say, um, <laughs> Anglicanism, um, whether actually we're doing, we're doing the wrong thing and, and um, whether, whether we should regard Christianity as a kind of bulwark against something worse. Um, at Hilaire Belloc's rhyme, and always keep a hold of nurse for fear of finding something worse. Um, but going back to the evolution question with which I, with which I started, the, the argument that is put by, by our scientific colleagues are interested in this is, um, if you tell people that uh, evolution is incompatible with God, then you've lost the battle because they're never going to give up God. So you've got to tell them, no, you can keep God and have evolution as well. And I can see there's a lot of sense in that. But you could turn that argument entirely on its head and say, yes, by all means, let their pastors tell them that evolution is incompatible with God. Let them be thoroughly imbued with the idea that evolution is incompatible with God, because we know evolution is true, and we can prove it. So if we do that, then we've got them. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's also... Yeah. I wanted to point out also, there's the question of scale. Um, when I lived in the Netherlands, the Netherlands is a fairly secular society. Um, and I think that it's one place where you don't really need an atheist convention because a lot of people consider themselves free thinkers and, uh, and are rational. Now, before, let's say, Islam became a question, I always asked them how they dealt then with the fundamentalist Christians. And what they explained to me was once upon a time, the entire Netherlands was, you know, one fundamentalist Christian, except for a sliver of society. And people then started to gradually move. I mean, talk about evolution, <laughs> gradually evolved yeah. Yeah. and became more rational. So it was easy to then let these pockets of radical Christians. And they are very, very radical. I mean, these are communities that do not vaccinate their children yeah. because it's God's will. But they were just allowed to, to be like that because the Dutch were confident over a generation or two this will simply evolve and, um, and they will change. Then came Islam, that changed the debate. But um, the question of scale, of you know, a people, a society, gradually moving away from irrationality. At least irrationality based on God, or inspired by God. Yeah, I, th I think the ev evolution point is also... <laughs> 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 Don't do that again. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. Uh, 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 
the, the point is not to get, at least I don't think the point is to get people to believe in evolution merely for the sake of believing in evolution. The point is to get people to think rationally about the data of their senses and, and to understand logical arguments. And to, we, we want people to think in the style of science, not merely to sign on the dotted line after each, each scientific uh, finding. And so, yeah, for, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly sympathetic with your, your bias, which is fine, set, set the opposition as zero sum as can be because we know science is steadily eroding the, the truth claims of religion every day. And it's just, it's just a matter of time that, the, that that becomes obvious to everybody. And it has become obvious with, with, the, with the exception of you know, people who won't vaccinate uh, or, or you know, Christian scientists who won't use medicine of any kind. In, in, in medicine, it's more or less obvious. You don't go to your priest for a diagnosis. And, and that's, um, and anyone who does go to, you know, people when we see on cable television that there's some community in, in uh, the South that is still performing exorcisms on their children when their children are clearly epileptics, we, that's just, that's a, a, a phantasmagorically stupid thing to do and it's looked at as child abuse in, in our country. But do, we pay, have, sorry, go ahead. Do, we, do we have any concern that as this process continues, and I think I, I'm a real optimist about this, I see uh, religions losing ground everywhere and getting their leaders are frantic. A lot of the noise about religion is, is, is sort of desperation on the part of religious leaders who see the, their congregations uh, evaporating in front of them. But What's the end game look like when the only people that are religious are the fanatics in all the different uh, uh, varieties and we don't have any uh, intermediate groups, any C of E type groups as, as a buffer zone at all. Uh, have we thought about how, how, to, how to handle that situation? It's, it's, a, it's a, to me, Oops. It's a tough one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It is tough. I, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, um, is it, are we ready to think about an end game yet? I mean, I'd like to think we were, but, but um, uh, we're still heavily outnumbered in the world. But it's changing fast. I, I share in the optimism, though. I mean, I was talking last night, I think it was to Richard, about a report in Arabic, it's now out in the United States, and um, what an ex-Muslim translated it from the Arabic into English, and one of the instructions in the report to American Muslims is for them, it, it, the advice is, as a Muslim, do not enter into jobs of law enforcement, for if you do, you are in danger of being impressed by that system of law. <laughs> <laughs> and that system, this, this is literally what it says. Yeah, that system of law is man-made law, and so avoid becoming you know, a policeman, for instance. And I right. think with instructions like that, it just shows how weak mm. uh, and how insecure uh, these people are. And, and also that's why they use the argument right. of force, because they've actually run out of arguments of persuasion. Yeah. In my hunch is that religion changed more in the 20th century than it changed in the two millennia before that. And it may change in the next 20 years more than it changed in the 20th century. Mm. The information revolution, the transparency of information, for all its problems, seems to me to be such a radical change in the sort of selective environment in which religions live, that, that it's going to be evolve really fast or go extinct. Mm. And uh, it, maybe they'll all evolve into, uh, you know, Unitarians or something. Uh, <laughs> if, that, if that happened, we'd, there would be nothing more to worry about. But if you put yourself in the position of a fanatic who's prepared to kill and become yep, a suicide yep. bomber and try to imagine what is it, what's turned them into the, this kind of lunatic? Um, as, as Sam has said, in the case of the Islamic extremists, 
you, the thing you have to understand is these people really believe what they say they believe, which is not true of, I think, many yeah. Christians. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. what is it that has turned them into lunatics? And, and I can only think that, that the, it's the powerful force of childhood indoctrination. And if a madrasa or a Jesuit gets you at a certain critical age, it then becomes extremely difficult for a certain kind of personality, at least, to, to shake it off. And so... I, I think the truth is actually more depressing than that, because the, the data show that, it, for the most part, it's not madrasa-schooled people becoming suicide bombers. They're, they, they're you know, people who convert as teenagers, people who were secular, whose parents were reasonably secular, and, and, the, and the new generation become radicalized in a way that their parents aren't. This has happened in, in the UK to a, a great degree. Yes. And, and so it's... Um, so in that case, it's a kind of solidarity with, 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 with us versus them. And I mean... It, it, it's, just, it's just... I mean, this is something that you may not be well-placed to understand because mm -hmm. you're so... Uh, these ideas are so preposterous to you. But it is just the spread of memes. And most and people are ready to believe in paradise. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's not, there's not that much cognitive work that they have to do to believe that a, that a book was written by the creator of the universe or that, that, that you, you, there is a paradise you can go to under the right circumstances. And if, if, if Islam happens to be the, 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 the one that attracts them versus uh, uh, some other religion, it's just, you just... Play, connect the dots with it. It's pretty straightforward. Jihad is a central principle of the faith. And, and but if somebody comes up to me as, a, as an adult or even as a teenager and says, here's this book that says all this nonsense, I mean, wouldn't you be skeptical enough if you hadn't been to a madrasa? I, I'm quite surprised yeah. that, that you can be persuaded that, <clears throat> that a book written by nobody knows who, um, in whatever it is, six, 600 and something, um, actually contains the truth. Why should I believe this book rather than any other fairy tale? And I don't understand quite what the persuasive power is if it's not earlier indoctrination. I, I don't think that. No, I think there's another explanation that can contribute to this as well. Um, and it's a, oddly enough, it's a byproduct of Western influence Everywhere in the world now, young people are growing up seeing, oh, let's say, uh, Western television programs. They're seeing people leading lives of amazing uh, meaning, apparently. You know, they're, they're adventurous lives. These are lives with a real narrative arc. And they look at their own circumstances. They look at their, their conditions in their country, and they can't see a life for themselves with a narrative arc. And what would be more wonderful to have than a life of heroism and, uh, and danger? And so they are ready to set aside any skepticism if, they, if somebody can approach them and say, you want an exciting life? You want your life to have meaning? Uh, you don't want to be just a uh, you know, a beggar on the street or you don't want to be an unemployed engineer in Cairo? Here's a great thing for you to do. And I can see that that would be very appealing to be, many be a, people. Be a martyr. I mean, to uh, be a martyr, yes. Yeah. yes. But before you're a martyr, you're like James Bond. In, exactly. In, in yeah. Cosmic War. So. Yeah. yeah, Star Wars. Yeah. And there are other inducements. I mean, why do middle class, highly educated, liberal women convert to Islam? I've Actually, been, that, that I understand. You, you mentioned why? that in your talk, that why would they don the hijab and then say, now I'm liberated. Liberated from what, you yeah. asked. And, and that actually connects with what I was trying to communicate in my talk. There, there's, again, I think this is a, a crazy manifestation of the impulse, but uh, the impulse is, at least in some of them, to cut through all of the superficiality of life. You know, so if you're a woman who's, who, mm -hmm. who no longer has to worry about how she looks, no longer has to deal with that kind of attention from men, no longer has to be acquisitive in a, in a, in a materialistic sense, 
no, no, no longer has to succeed, not have to follow some kind of ambitious path as a, for a career, and you can just focus on what is sacred, and so, so you fill in the blank, but then, now you've got the Quran in front of you and, and, a, and a bunch of beliefs, but, but there is a kind of intensity of focus and, and, and a, uh, a protection from distraction and superficiality that, that people have traditionally thought, uh, sought uh, under the aegis of religion. And, I, and so um, that's the, the most charitable uh, thing I can say about it, but I, I, I understand it. It's just not, it's, it's clearly, it's, it's divisive and repressive and, and, and uh, disempowering in, in, in other ways. But. I on one of the most memorable things I remember in um, Infidel was when in Holland you finally took off your hijab and nobody raped me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no men jumped me. Yeah. You see, if, if you walk around without a hijab, you'll be jumped by men. So men are like animals. In fact, there was a, a, a famous imam here in Australia, uh, Hilal or someone like that, who compared women to a piece of meat and men to, you know, these wild um, he goats who, if they see a woman uncovered, will just jump her. So that, that came from somewhere. Um, but yeah, it, it does fascinate me. I think after reading the Quran, you convert from whatever you are, and you become a Muslim as a woman, you read the Quran, and maybe the first few days you feel a sense of focus and meditation and all that. But then after a while, you have to live and completely submit your will to a man who's supposed to take you whenever he likes. Your testimony is worth only half of his. He can beat you when he wants. Uh, you not don't too hard, though. Not too hard. Not too yeah. hard and all that. And so that is the part. It is the part, you know, what comes yeah. after yeah, no, that I think, yeah. whoa, uh, this is a form of, it's a form of madness to me, at least. Ayan, I think one of my favorite moments in Infidel was when you told about the book that opened your eyes, that changed your life, and it turned out it was a Nancy Drew mystery. <laughs> and I thought, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. Uh, maybe what we should be doing yes. is printing the Nancy Drew mysteries in, in Arabic and Pashtun and all other languages <laughs> and just flooding the Islamic world with books, which it would be very hard for them to say, this is subversive. I mean, these are just stories, just fantasies for girls, but life-changing fantasies. And if we thought cleverly about what innocent Western ideas we could, we could introduce in careful campaigns and just sit back and wait for all the little Ayan Hirsi Ali's <laughs> to grow up with these new dreams. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, perhaps we should switch to um, audience questions. Yeah. 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 A, good, a good idea. Good idea. Um, could we have the lights up? I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Good day. Thanks for the talk there from all of you. That was awesome. I just wanted to, uh, if I could steal a quick phrase, I choose to think for myself not because it is easy, but because it is hard. Do you think um, religious people or people that believe in faith are doing it because it's easy and they're a bit lazy? Uh, religious. I couldn't get that one. I didn't quite hear that. Did you? Is it, did you say, are religious people just lazy and... Lazy thinkers. Thinking for yourself is not easy, it's hard. Yeah. Are they just being a bit lazy thinking? Well, you know, I think, I think that we have to appreciate that most people aren't like us <laughs> in that they're not deeply reflective and interested in these issues. And that's okay. Um, a, a lot of people, I think, uh, it's just never an important issue in their own lives. 
And so they just sort of go along with whatever the tradition in the family is. I'm not sure that's laziness. I think they're just, they don't have, they're not intellectuals at all. They're not the kind of reflective people that worry about these things and end up, you know, uh, if they're unlucky, becoming theologians, and if they're lucky, they become atheists. <laughs> Well, to take the other side of that, though, it, it, theologians are not lazy. They're doing some very hard work. <laughs> and that's, that's, you know, it's, yeah. they're, spe they're burning a lot of fuel trying to make sense of their doctrines. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's, uh, yeah. I'm actually quite hopeful about the, about the ones who are, as Dan says, just not that interested because it seems to me then our challenge is simply to make them interested. And we can do that through science uh, because we really can make science interesting. I mean, it's, science is, is fascinating and um, it should be possible, or, or indeed lazy people also we should be able to get, to get interested. The people who are very hard to reach are those who are so absolutely dyed in the wool uh, yeah. with their faith uh, that, that they are unchangeable and unreachable and stop up their ears when you even try to interest them. So I would be encouraged if there are any lazy, lazy people out there, um, I, w I would go after them and, and try to interest them in science. Okay, uh, shall we have another one from the room? Yeah. Uh, how about down here? Uh, my name is Bob Irwin. You may have seen some of my cartoons that I sent to the Australian Atheist Mag. I'm still here to tell the tale and they were Christian cartoons. Perhaps that's one reason we should be going for Christianity and not other religions. Uh, I'd like to ask the, the panel whether you think that's the best approach because um, it might be easier to go for one rather than other religions. If Christianity goes into my demise, other religions which are you know, based on similar premises may also see their end coming. I wish. Mm. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, I, I think you, you have to attack the root of the problem, and the root of the problem exposes the problem with all religions. Uh, I, I mean, I'm sensitive to, actually the question I posed to Ayan was not so much encouraging uh, Christianity as a stepping stone to reason, although that's kind of an interesting discussion to have. Um, my experience has just been that only Christians, serious Christians, really get the problem of Islam. Because when you talk to secularists about the problem of Islam, you get a lot of people who just don't believe that, that, that jihadists really believe what they say they believe. It's all politics, it's all economics, it's not, it doesn't really have to do with an expectation of paradise. When you talk to serious Christians who, you know, Sarah Palin style Christians who believe their own craziness, they have no doubt that the Muslims are, are believe, believe what they say they believe. And, and they're motivated based on a rational fear of, 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 of Islam. So, but I think you, I think the, we just have to talk about what is obviously reasonable to believe insofar as we can see it, and that has the same kind of steamrolling effect over all, all religions. Let's go at the top. Uh, my question is about the future of Islam and world peace. As you said, there is no way to speak out against Islam without putting yourself in danger. What can we do basically besides resulting in all-out war against this fascist political ideology, or is war the only answer? Um, well, I think one suggestion was given uh, by Dan Dennett now uh, with uh, the Nancy Drew book, uh, not just... <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I, I mean, I'm not saying, uh, and it wasn't really in infidel, it wasn't just Nancy Drew, but what uh, reading did for me was it introduced me to a world um, where I could think as an individual. So if you start to think about what is wrong with Islam, it's this huge collective and the individual has to submit and submit completely. Um, so if you introduce to those communities ideas about first and foremost having an identity of your own as an individual with choices and freedom and so on, um, that then you start uh, gradually to erode this whole concept of total and, and utter submission. And 
there's one way of doing it. I, I, I mean, I've been saying blasphemy is the way out. And mm. in, a, in, in a way, it's good to have these cartoons and um, to ridicule the Prophet Muhammad, maybe just so that people get used to the idea that, um, you know, if Allah is as powerful uh, as the Quran says, uh, and Muhammad is as powerful, maybe the Muslim mind will then just sit back and say, let Allah defend his own name against <laughs> these infidels. I don't expect that anytime soon. <laughs> but the, the idea of developing a competing narrative um, that is made available to Muslims and that creates a cognitive dissonance and doing it over and over and over again, that for me is the way to compete with the Islamists for the hearts and minds of people whom they have either indoctrinated or scared into believing that life is much better after death than it is before death. There's something rather... <laughs> There's something paradoxical, I think, about Islam, which is that um, the, the extremists are... are they, they hate anybody to enjoy themselves. You're not allowed music, you can't dance, you can't fly yeah. kites. Um, and it's incredibly bossy. Every, every single thing you do in your life, you, you, the way you brush your teeth, the way you brush yes. your hair, everything is laid down, precisely how many strokes of the hairbrush, etc. you should do. Um, what is the benefit to a religion of being so unpleasant? Why do people... It, it reminds me of... There was a classic experiment in my own field of animal behavior. You know the phenomenon of imprinting when baby chicks um, follow the first object that they see at, at a certain time, whether it's Conrad Lawrence's boots or whatever it is. Um, a man called Hess at the University of Chicago did a rather cruel experiment, wouldn't be allowed to do it now. Um, he was imprinting chicks and he found that if he trod on their toes and caused them pain, they were more likely to follow him than if he was kind to them. Uh, and I suppose the interpretation is that they're, they're, they're programmed by their genes to follow the, the, the mother figure. And even if it's the mother figure that's stepping on their toes, that makes them even more scared. So they want to follow the mother figure even more. But perhaps that makes it not so relevant to the case. But it looks to me as though religions actually prosper by being obnoxious, by actually being, making life hard mm. for, their, for their followers. And yeah. that seems to me a paradox, but it's, I believe it's true of Roman Catholicism as well. Yeah. We have a question yeah. up there. Uh, religious people around the world uh, hear the voice of God. Adults that hear voices are designated to be insane or have a mental illness. When will religion be a mental illness? What is it? One of my dreams is to accomplish the same inversion for this issue that we have recently more or less accomplished for drunk driving. In the United States, it used to be that drunk drivers were, were treated rather leniently because, you know, the poor devil, he was drunk, he didn't know what he was doing. We've turned that around and now you're doubly culpable. You got yourself drunk, you're, you're, you're more to blame you're more to blame morally for, for getting yourself drunk uh, and, and causing damage. And I would love to see that attitude for, for religious, for, the, where, for anybody who commits any crime or, or any violence because of religious enthusiasm, we should hold that person doubly responsible. We should say this is a work. Actually, I don't know if they're revising this in the, in the DSM-5, but in the DSM-4, which is the, the main clinical handbook for diagnosing mental illness in, in, in the U.S., I don't know if there's a different one here, uh, the delusion is defined as a, you know, an irrational belief for which there is no evidence, something like that, but ex explicitly religious beliefs are accepted. <laughs> so you, you actually, if you're hearing voices, if the, the right sort of voices saying the right crazy religious things, you may, you may have no diagnosis under that. Uh, do we have a question down here? Uh, yes. Uh, Daniel Dennett, uh, I uh, still heard you saying that you hope for the next 10, 20 years 
even the religious influence would be different, would change, that generally what was happening is undermining the uh, power of the religion in our society. Now, what is your position on our, oh, sorry, other uh, superstitions really taking root and coming up, becoming more popular and kind of filling up the vacuum that's uh, created by the undermined religion? I think you make a good point in that uh, uh, one of the uh, particular viruses of the internet are the con sort of conspiracy theory viruses and the uh, uh, other lunacies of that sort which spread, uh, or just new age babble of one sort or another which, which has a, a, a nice grip on people's imaginations. For the very same reason, I think, that religious beliefs have always done. They're, they are, they are uh, ideas that, that are piquant, that are exciting, that are uh, memorable, that you want to pass on to your neighbor, uh, uh, and that this is, this is the disposition in the human vector that this particular meme exploits. And so we're, we're, we're going to have to deal with that problem of infectious stupidity, uh, which will spread uh, with, without organized religion. It's already spreading. And that's, a, that's an issue that we're going to have to deal with. G.K. Chesterton said, when people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing, they believe in anything. <laughs> yes. A sobering thought. <laughs> and we have a lady down here. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'd just like to ask whether, because we're appealing, the premises we're appealing to people's intellect to believe in something that's rational, but I believe um, religion actually uh, appeals to people's emotional needs, which is why it's a stronger argument per se, as opposed to the intellectual argument that we are proposing to them. Yeah, I think the, the, the split between reason and emotion has been, is a meme which, which should be retired. I, mean, yes. I, I think that there is no clean, there's certainly neurologically no clean line between them. And uh, I would call doubt an emotion and a feeling of conviction an emotion. And so we're, we're constantly played uh, uh, as emotional beings when we are doing the most rigorous reasoning. Uh, so it's, uh, but it's true, you can, you, can, you can be talking at a level that is inaccessible to people, uh, but insofar as we're talking really about things that, 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 uh, things that people care about, and, and it, when we're talking about the well-being of their children, for instance, uh, we, the talk of science, insofar as it's relevant to that, that case, is going to be... Uh, I mean, it connects directly with what they care about. I mean, it's, it's emotional in a very deep sense. Uh, so I think it's not, um, it's true that science doesn't have music or some, something that's, that's, that's hitting that channel. And we, all, we really do just have arguments and descriptions about the way the world is. But, but I think it's, um, when something really matters, people tend to want the truth. It's just there's the, the, the burden of communicating the truth, getting over the, the barriers of dogmatism is, is, is often impossible. But people, people, really, people don't want their children to die. So people want to know why their children are getting sick. And, and insofar as we can make the case for, for, for vaccination, say. I mean, well, the thing that's humbling is that even making the case for vaccination is damn hard in this world. And, and the internet has enabled that those kinds of conspiracy thinking and, and pseudoscience in a way that would sort of be unthinkable without the internet. So it's, it's, it's hard to even talk about very important things for which there, there's a mountain of data uh, when people can just uh, live in an echo chamber and, and uh, not really consider the evidence. I'm gonna disagree with you about one little thing. You said science doesn't have music. Well, but I think it not not uh, not symphonies. Yes. Yes. But I think one of the things that never ceases to delight me 
is the wonderful science writing that is out there, with Richard being as great an, uh, a, an artist in this as anybody in the world. And this is inspiring. This, this does have an emotional effect oh, yes, on children yeah. and adults. And I think yeah. we should recognize that and honor it. Yeah. Yeah. Needless to say, I, I agree with that. It's just, I think the, the, question, yeah. the question is, you, you, we still find people in the world who are mightily attached to something that is religious, for which there's not an obvious surrogate in the domain of science or, or reason or, or something that's r rationally justified. And if we're playing the game of one-to-one -one swapping, how are you going to replace mm. Santa Claus? What are you going to put into this Santa Claus-shaped hole in my life? We don't have an answer for that, and that's and it's kind of the wrong game to be playing. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid that is all the time we have. Can you please put your hands together for? for us? Thank you. Well done. So, I'm leaving.